Carlson's live podcast clips, episode 2.2. And then, then our problem is now not the right trying to keep the eye on the Russian ball, but the left trying to keep the eye on the anthropogenic global warming ball. Just to name exactly. the that's I was going to say yeah, the, 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 the climate change implication, the um, you know the anthropogenic sixth great mass extinction. All of these things have political implications, and they're that's not right. necessarily going to be supported by the uh, idea of of something from space because of all the reasons you just said. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think it is clear that, um, you know, that, 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 you know, you could certainly associate, you know, biblical archaeology with the right. Mm -hmm. I think there's no question that you could associate right. that with, mm -hmm. with, um, the, the, the right and the fundamentalist interpretation of the Bible, the literalist interpretation, mm -hmm. which again, whether it is or isn't, is really has no bearing on the evidence. The evidence is what, what we refer to and the evidence is what validates or not the, the, the hypothesis. But but there is that connection there, and so I think you know, especially now with the momentum and the, the the funding that the whole climate change climate crisis thing has brought on, you know, that's a that would be for those that are promoting that point of view to start talking about things from space as as a distraction. We want to keep that's right. focused on the fear porn that can be attributed to the actions of human beings, and for all those reasons, like you just said, you cannot blame something from space on any faction or another or any party or another. I think that has a huge part of it. And that is leaked over into academia. And I do know that some of the most vociferous critics early on of the comet impact hypothesis were also proponents of the overkill hypothesis. That's the right. overkill hypothesis, in other words, the, the, the mass extinction of megafauna caused by paleo-Indian nomadic small tribes of hunters sweeping over the planet, wiping out everything in their path, that, that scenario is being invoked as, as uh, exhibit A to support the notion that we are now currently in something equivalent, the sixth great mass extinction. And I know that at least several of the names who were prominent in the, as the early critics were definitely associated and published um, papers in support of the overkill hypothesis. And so if you're promoting yeah. the idea that that humans were responsible for the for the for the destruction of the extinction of the megafauna, you don't want somebody else coming along saying, well, uh, no, I think it was something from space that did the job. So that's so right. It, it was a yeah. very convenient political narrative in the 60s when yeah. when that was rolled out by Paul Martin, right? Paul Martin, yeah. And he was an ideologue in my my view and it was very fashionable still is but that was the early earliest rollout of that fashion to be self-loathing without getting into the details but some i'm not a denier per se but i am a I look at things in a relative sense you know relative threat and whatnot mm -hmm. and i see the <laughs> the conversation that we're having over global warming uh, being akin to a couple sitting in their car screaming at each other over what's on the radio station, <laughs> but the car is sitting on the train tracks, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And they're sitting there playing with that knob, fighting over it. You know, here we are, but shit, nobody's looking left or right. God damn, we're on the train track. Yeah, it's important what's on the radio, but let's pull the hell off the train track before we bitch about whether it's rock and roll or country, you know? And mm -hmm, that's what we're talking mm -hmm. about is the difference between, you know, one degree Celsius and two degrees Celsius and that's 50 years. No way, bro. It's rock and roll, rock and roll all the way. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. See, you just want the argument so bad. But yeah, fuck that train. Let's argue. Well, we can throw you a little know. bluegrass in there. <laughs> in the right, mix, right. Can't right, we? Right, right. That's right. But it's unfortunate. But, we, you know, we're working our way out of it. And I, I, I'm a little bit of a believer in the amnesia hypothesis. I think something shocked us. It, 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 it just... Well, Shot yes, I think that yeah. it, to me, I've said for years now, I think it's going to take perhaps a shock. Look, if another Tunguska event occurs and, and given now the, the probability statistics of what we know, I mean, we're probably overdue for a Tunguska sized Tunguska scale event. And if we have one of those again, I mean, heaven forbid, and I'm, you know, it's, it's, you know, a, a too bad that it might take that, but I think that would do the job. Well, let's hope it, let's hope it does happen, but or you know, but it's over <laughs> deep ocean. Well, see that it's but already that's happened. Right, yeah. We've already been given that example by the cosmos. Look, here it is yeah. over you know a remote region. 
there, it's still not so remote that we're not up in the tundra. We're in the Tiaga, so all of the tree blow down. You can be able to study that. You can find microspherals embedded in the trees. You can just, you know, you can look at the whole pattern of this. There's, you'll learn about, because if it was, if it had been any further north, we wouldn't have known about it. Of course, if it had been a, what, what, what was it, Georgia, you know, eight minutes later? No, I, not eight minutes later, but a few hours later, it would have walked yeah, yeah, no, no. Leningrad. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah, probably yeah, yeah. like two yeah. hours or something like that. Yeah, change yeah. the course of twentieth century history. Yeah, I was just, I was just saying, let's sure. hope it hope happens over water. Well, again, because no, Russ, I actually tweeted that exact same thing because it had always been bouncing around in my head. I said, let me just verbalize this. I saw, I tweeted a few weeks ago. I said something along the lines of, "Does anyone else kind of secretly, or is it okay to root on another Tunguska?" It's just out in the middle of nowhere and very well recorded, right? Yeah. Maybe kill a sea turtle or two, right? <laughs> but but that actually would be ideal yeah, it would for be people ideal. like us. I mean, ideal. You know, you don't want to root one in and then it goes the wrong place and we're at fault, but that's not going to happen, <laughs> no, right? right? But no if you could... To, yeah, no one wants it to happen over a huge city. You know, that's right. I don't, I don't even want it to happen over... You know, you don't want it to happen over anywhere where people are going to get killed, but you do want people to pay attention you know that's right it happened where it was well recorded but out in the middle of the pacific somewhere where it doesn't hurt any person it, it would change the it would freak people out completely and it would exactly. change it would change the discussion yeah and exactly. what really changes if you had two or three over a long weekend but yeah. you oh, know yeah, one yeah, of those yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 and I, I look forward, I think people need to start, and I, I want to see more of the mainstream guys and the NASA guys address it, but to that, 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 that comets are the problem and that our little meteor showers were the, is, is the problem. It's just a difference in scale of what happens. And everybody's so hooked on a asteroids. We're sending the DART mission to an asteroid. Well, you can't send one to necessarily to comet fragments, so that'd be tough, and I don't know where they're, Schwassman, Wachman, Randall, you know, can be mm -hmm. approached. That's probably impossible. You know, so <laughs> you may be an asteroid, but that's not the prime threat, obviously, according to our kind of catastrophism, which right. was so well supported by the TARD paper recently. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That it's it's comet fragments and it's a shotgun blast and it's a hell of a lot more common. None of their math, Boslow's touched it once and he didn't get it right, but none of them will touch the idea for years they were criticizing about the likelihood of one pinpoint hitting the earth. That's right. That's unlikely. Yeah, yeah. And all comet math impact math is done on the idea that one solid body slams into the earth. Well, no, no. If they fragment like the current big boy that we just detected that they know is fragmenting out there further than it should be able yeah. to fragment where they call that big old long name. Bellini, BB Bellini, Bellini Baradelli. Yeah, Bernadelli, yeah. Bellini, or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll call it BB, baby, because BB. it's a BB. That's, that's yeah, it. yeah, yeah. It's a BB for mm -hmm. sure. And that that thing's fragmenting out there, and they can't even explain how in the hell it. it apparently, it's too far to be fragmenting. But and Bernadelli then got, Bernstein oh, or something like that. Bernadelli Bernstein. Yeah, God, you know, thank goodness it's going to miss us by a long shot. But it it shows in there that obviously comments have fragmented, or you wouldn't have meteor showers. And within our lifetime, we've seen multiple fragmentation events including one now that's 100 miles wide. We only claim the YD thing was 60 miles wide. And within our lifetime, we're seeing an incoming comet that was not really supposed to happen, mm -hmm. you know, that, 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 that's turning into fragments out there. And all you need to have the YD happen, when you have those fragments go out into a cloud, again, back to the pinpoint versus the cloud, the, the odds of hitting a piece of the cloud are a hell of a lot greater than hitting the original parent body if it were still intact. And they don't do that math. But the other that is not, is, I, yeah. Well, I was just going to say that like um, large comets hitting the sun. I mean, we've talked about this on Cosmographia too. Yeah. It can yeah. cause uh, coronal mass ejections that can then affect the earth. So there's a lot of different ways, you know, these comets can, can affect us. I was reading about the DART mission too, and it, it's like in the article, I can't remember if they were quoting the scientist or whatever, but they're like, these impacts can only cause regional destruction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they're downplaying the, you know, the threat in and of itself. So I did, it's. Well, impact scientists are the only class of threat scientists that throughout their career 
have two conflicting objectives. One is this is dangerous and more money. We need more money. Right. <laughs> you know, they're always going to say Don't that. Worry, You're not going to find it. Happen. It'll be fine. But, but then at the same time, they have that, that contrary thing, but, but, but it's not really that dangerous. It's just theoretically dangerous, you know, which is such yeah. a bad, that's a, it's a, such a bad posture when we have abundant evidence that, yeah, you can get more money, go ahead and pivot a little bit and look at the work of, of Klub and Napier and all of them and go ahead and adequately refute it instead of, instead of ignore it, which is w- where it's been. And, and Orofino did that. But I think our best bet is the retiring cadre of folks from NASA that, that started in the 70s, and they're all aging out. And my great hope is that they're going to be, you know, young scientists that can come in and take another look at things. Probably some listening to this live stream right now mm-hmm. that'll screw up the courage to go out and take, you know, whether it be astronomical thing, you know, the astronomical approach and, and provide more support, support that this is astronomically possible or the geological approach and, and, and take a good look at the record because that's relatively inexpensive. It's a hell of a lot less expensive to go dig in the dirt and sift out the spherules and count them versus all It's tedious as shit, but it ain't quite as hard, you know, as sending out probes. <laughs> that's right. Right. Yep. And I know Randall, you feel the same way that the, the key to this whole thing is getting people to look at the past. Mm -hmm. Because uh, impact threats are always repent, repent. It's coming at us now. It's always forward looking. But I think the best bang for the buck is either ruling out or confirming our beliefs that this has happened multiple times in the geological record. And that science is there. Those tools are there. And it's not that damn expensive. But they're just a handful of people in the world that are even engaging in the science. Yeah. What well, makes me wonder, though, you know, if we do have one of these Tunguska or or maybe larger comes into Siberia again or over the ocean, does does that wake people up and and make something happen and and be proactive on the next one, or or is there going to be the general idea that well, phew, that wasn't so bad. Now there's not going to be another one for a thousand years. We'll let the later generations deal with it. Well, I think the answer mm-hmm. to that is that you know the rigorous work into our into the past, you know, showing over and over again that these events haven't been rare, basically making that argument in a very, very convincing way, you know, what's going to happen, I think, is that eventually, you know, the critics are going to get exposed for what they are. They're agenda-driven scientists. You know, there's there's politics intertwined with their, uh, you, know, mm-hmm. their, their, you know, their interpretations of the evidence and so on. So I think it's just a matter of, you know, who's going to who's gonna do the best work, you know, who's going to get their message out there. And I think right now what's happening is we are getting this message out there. And it's, um, you know, I, I mean, just when I look back over 10 years ago, I mean, 10 years ago, who who even had the slightest idea what you what you were talking about when you were talk, mentioned the younger Dryas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yep. know, and, and now it's really almost, um, you know, becoming commonplace. I, you know, all the time I'm seeing people come, even though a lot of the comments, they don't know what they're talking about. At least they, you yeah, know. Right. Yeah, it's an awareness. Recognize the term. That's that's good. <laughs> you know, if we get some funding and we get to go out into the places, Randall, that we, you know, we've looked at, we've proposed that, hey, this looks like an impact site. You know, what it, what does it look like when it hits a mile and a half of ice first? You yeah. Know, how much how much impact? Uh, you know, evidence is there actually in the in the landscape itself? But we've identified quite a few places. You know, uh, up to you know ten or twelve even. You know, to be able to go out and and find the evidence that proves these things, uh, you know, in in that 12,000, 13,000 year ago time frame, uh, well, it's going to be outstandingly fun. My uh, very anecdotal and unofficial barometer of awareness is just my now, well, it goes back 25 years, but since the paper came out in 2007, Googling Younger Dryas, and when Twitter came along, sticking it in the Twitter search bar, because one good thing about Younger Dryas is it doesn't pop up in any other context. That word Dryas is a great term because yeah. it's only got, you're going to be reading about the flower and there's not much there. But back to when you put it into Twitter, it used to be somebody mentioned that term maybe once a week, talking 10 years ago, right around when Twitter got came out. I didn't tweet much back then, but I was on it and uh, maybe seven, eight years ago. But you get every few days somebody would mention the younger Dryas and now it's 20 times a day, 10 times a day. It's Mm -hmm. just going up and Mm -hmm. that's awareness. And uh, Randall and Brad and snakes, man, y'all have done a lot to bring that awareness, particularly you Randall. So, you know, eat fresh vegetables, you know, and stay healthy, dude. You got a big job for the planet here, man. 
and going on Rogan and getting him into it, you know, mm. is invaluable. <laughs> and so welcome to people like me. I remember in 2007, you know, you talked Ice Age Impact. There was no awareness. And it was so neat as we were writing that paper. I'm like, wow, this is going to be neat to see how this filters through the public consciousness. And of course, you hope it'll take off. Didn't take off. But it ain't nothing but up. The awareness is nothing but grown. I don't see anything stopping it. And at some point, perhaps internationally, but before the U.S., it's going to result in good institutional money being dedicated to searches to confirm or refute the claims we've been making on these podcasts.